to join us. We've got quite a few. I'll go ahead and just start introducing us. So my name is Sarah Wolsey. This is an infection prevention update for long-term care facility providers. Welcome, thank you for being here today. Go ahead, next slide. As I mentioned, we are on a Zoom uh, webinar today. Most of you are here by Zoom and you'll see at the bottom of your screen a chat box. That'll be the way that you can communicate to us during the presentation. So use that chat. When you're picking chatting, let's go ahead and have you select two, all panelists and attendees. And that will ensure that folks um, get, their, get their questions on. Next slide. As I mentioned, um, we're Comagine Health. We are a national nonprofit consulting firm. We are a quality innovation network, quality improvement organization, working to improve care for Medicare, Medicare patients just like you are improving care for Medicare patients. The session today was developed at the request of some of our partners in Utah to support their understanding of PPU, PPE use and the current climate with a COVID infection. We wanna share current best evidence and strategies from our partners. We're learning a lot from the experiences of Washington State, which remains ground zero for the US pandemic. We wanna just take a second to thank all of you for being here because we know there's lots of things you could do with your time and you're choosing to spend some of your precious time with us. Next slide. Again, my name is Sarah Wolsey. I'm the Medical Director for System-Wide Quality Improvement at Comagine Health. And Martha, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Martha Jaworski. I'm a Senior Quality Advisor with Comagine Health. All right, and we're gonna, um, you've already started introducing yourself, thank you. We're just getting you to practice your chat and then also see who's here with us. And thank you for chatting your name, organization and location. And then for anybody who's just on the phone, I'm not sure if we have anybody like that, we won't be able to hear your, your chat, obviously, um, but we will have you send questions to the registration email. You'll get a copy of the slides and a recording at the end, and we wanna make sure you get your questions answered that way. Next slide. So we're gonna go ahead now and have uh, uh, our Comagine Health um, state, uh, sorry, state leads introduce themselves. And this is just a chance for you to see and hear the voices of people you may be communicating with. Um, their emails will be shared as a part of the chat. So let's go ahead and introduce uh, ourselves. Go ahead, Connie. Hi, I'm Connie Lauder, and I am the Improvement Advisor for Idaho and the team lead for the Nursing Home Project. Thank you, Connie. Donna. Hi, I'm Donna Thorson. I'm a Senior Improvement Advisor located in the Las Vegas, Nevada office. All right, Shannon. Hi, everyone. Shannon Kupka. I'm an Improvement Advisor in New Mexico, and thanks so much for being here. And Leah. Hi, everyone. My name is Leah Brandis, and I work in Oregon as a Senior Improvement Advisor. Welcome. Thanks. Adrian. Hi, my name is Adrian Butterwick. I'm an Improvement Advisor here in the Salt Lake City, Utah office. Okay, and Jeff. Hi, everybody. This is Jeff West here in the Seattle office. I'm a Senior Improvement Advisor for Comagine Health. And then Kristen. Hi, everybody. I'm Kristen Dittmeyer, and I work with Jeff out of our Seattle, Washington office. And thank you all for being here today. All right, and just they will be available throughout the chat. So if there's a, a state specific question, they're gonna help us answer that. So thank you all. Next slide. So our agenda today is we're gonna talk about key messages for the current state of the COVID crisis and for prevention of COVID-19. We're gonna have Martha review uh, PPE best practices and contingencies. We have best practice sharing from Kathy Owens, one of our partners uh, from Avalon Care and then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. Please know the slides again have been shared and will be shared again after the presentation along with the recording. Next slide. So just key messages. Um, it's no surprise, long-term care facility residents are our highest risk members in our community with their frailty and comorbid conditions. We also know that healthcare workers are the most likely source of the infection based on data from outbreaks and we wanna talk about how to keep ourselves safe uh, as we transition. Partnership and communication are key during this outbreak. There's a lot of stress and we need to ensure that we're highly in communication with our public health authorities, our own staff, and then anytime one of our residents is transitioning, this is a key point to maintain safety. 
Next slide. So when you suspect a positive case, this may be review for a number of you, but just to reinforce, as soon as an ill resident is identified, you wanna restrict that individual to a private room with a bathroom, begin a respiratory protection, have them wear a mask and have your staff wear appropriate PPE, what you have available, and begin an assessment program for that resident for increasing symptoms, as well as like an assessment program in all of your residents. As we know, COVID-19 is, is a high uh, rate of contagion. At the bottom, there's a link from the CDC, has a line list for documenting symptoms on a regular basis. You may wanna adapt that for your use as a best practice. If you have a, po a suspect a positive case, you're gonna notify your health department of, of concerns, you're gonna also notify, notify them for clusters of severe upper respiratory infections in your patients or in your staff, and that would be three cases in 72 hours. You're also gonna to wanna to notify if you transfer a patient with severe illness. We recommend that you get a list of testing options for your facility and your location and figure out how you can obtain them, uh, how long it takes for them to come back, each state has a different protocol and recommendation because the availability of tests changes from day to day and day to day, day to day and week to week in each state. So be, um, be cognizant of that and check regularly for what your options are. You're gonna want to plan for multiple cases. Room sharing is going to be necessary for multiple cases, depending on your state level planning. And again, be in touch with your state about any options for cohorting COVID positive patients or other, other um, contingencies. You'll want to create your own plan for co cohorting residents that are COVID positive and medical supplies. You're going to have folks with like diagnosis of respiratory illness together, flu patients together, COVID-19 patients together. You're going to want to plan for dedicating healthcare providers and equipment for those particular cohorts. Plan for protocols for reused items especially, diet trays, gate belts, therapy equipment, CPAP equipment or blood pressure or temperature equipment, and think about plans for reused medications such as a patient's own eye drops or inhalers. What will your plan B to plan B to ensure those are secured but also um, infection uh, protected? Consider hospital transfers as potential exposures and step down cohorts of those patients for 14 days if that's available. Next slide. And finally, we wanna mention, as I said, COVID-19 really tests our transitions. And our transitions are key times when if we're cognizant of our risk of transmitting COVID-19, we hopefully can put those uh, protocols in place to, to do the best job we can. We suggest we have protocols for patients that are exiting facilities, canceling non-essential care, or working to make care virtual as much as possible when that's possible. If you're particularly interested in teleoptions and developing that program, please let us know. We wanna see if that's a potential place we can support our facilities in developing those options. You wanna mask your patient while they're out as much as possible. You wanna have a thoughtful protocol for new patient admissions that is based on what your state recommendations are as well as availability of your beds. You wanna think about transfer protocols. Do you want EMS workers entering your facility or is it best to have a resident meet them outside to reduce that transmission risk as they come into your, your building? You wanna think about incoming caregivers. We're all screening for temperature and URI symptoms. We also may want to screen incoming caregivers for where they've been. Have they been caretaking COVID positive patients? And that will help both with thinking about what PPE is available for them and tracing in case you do have a positive case. Last thing, transitions, clean break rooms. If you have staff dedicated to caring for COVID positive patients and staff who are not, you want to think about is that break room an interface where there could be inter-staff contamination um, with gowns or other types of equipment. So think about that. My last two slides are about communication and engagement. We want to just rec remind, and we'll have Kathy Owens be talking today about training and evaluation. Training and evaluation ensure that we use our scarce resources properly and we empower staff to know the right thing to do and document their competency. We want to identify champions and peer leaders to help us as this work needs to be done and empower them to provide supportive feedback to their peers. And last for communication, we want to create a space for that 
in our huddles, in our shift changes. We wanna have time where we're seeking solution from those in the front line doing the work. We wanna ask them, how can we deal with the situation at hand? What are the current shortcuts that you're noticing? How can we standardize things? What are the important things we wanna to measure to know that this is going how we think it should go? And wanna reinforce a mod and model a culture of safety. Next slide. This is a reminder as we're in this high risk time, we need to plan for the space to maintain collaboration, ensure blame free environments, and do our best to ensure we continue to advocate that we are doing our best to keep folks safe um, despite scarce resources. So continue to ask questions. I see some coming in. We appreciate them. I'll turn the time over to Martha and we'll start to address questions at, at the end of her presentation. Thank you. Martha, we can't hear you. Ah, sorry, I forgot to unmute. I apologize. Uh, well, thank you for joining us today. I'm gonna to take about 20 minutes to review basic IP principles and present the current uh, CDC crisis guidelines for use of PPE. Uh, as you're aware, the situation is changing on a daily basis and processes are in flux, but uh, hopefully some of the basics uh, remain the same over time. Um, we also have the guest, our guest, uh, Kathy Owens from Avalon Health Care Management, and she will speak uh, about making quick policy and procedure changes in response to crisis and educating staff on these changes. So uh, we'll give um, you some basics and then some insight into operational, operationalizing recommendations. So I'm gonna start with four basic messages. The first one uh, you've heard a million times it is the new word, social distancing. And I wanted to bring it up. Uh, everyone knows they need to be doing it out in the community, but uh, as Dr. Woolsey mentioned, even places like the break room at work, uh, you can practice social distancing at work even just to minimize uh, any transmission among healthcare workers. So I'll start with that. Uh, the next Martha? one. Martha, yes. can you show your slides? Yes, yes. Okay. I am moving, I'm gonna move just right into hand hygiene, that's the next topic. Um, so uh, with, with hand hygiene, uh, the biggest, I think, um, messaging right now is to maintain your program. So don't let that kind of drop off because you are uh, in a crisis. Um, do be out there and looking at processes and how hand hygiene is working within those processes. And in particular, when you start looking at reuse and extended use of PPE, you wanna be looking at times when people need to be doing hand hygiene now or maybe they didn't need to in a previous process. So um, you you know try to look at your your uh, opportunities through a slightly different lens. How are things changing, and how is hand hygiene changing with that? I think it's very important to include residents in your program if you don't already now. Uh, in particular, one time in particular is before eating that could. You know, help with uh, you know that time when you're bringing your hands up to your face um, and prevent transmission potentially. Um, consider evaluating your program. The World Health Organization has uh, hand hygiene self-assessment, um, something you could consider uh, as part of a QAPI program. Um, also to point out that this question has come up, the alcohol-based hand sanitizer is totally effective against coronavirus. It's different than uh, like a norovirus, which is very difficult to penetrate coronavirus easily killed with the hand sanitizer. So don't, uh, don't touch your face, another message we're hearing a lot, uh, but I just wanna point out that a lot of people do it and do not know they're doing it. It's a habit and peer feedback can be really important now. So that might be a message you send out that it's okay to uh, tell other people and it's you don't be offended type of situation if somebody points that out to you. Because yeah, the, it's, it's interesting if you really start watching people, uh, there are a lot of habits out there. I know I do it. Um, I try not to, but it happens. And especially now with allergies are really coming on um, and that makes itchy eyes and itchy noses. Uh, so try to really keep on top of that and, you know, do hand hygiene, remove your gloves and change them as needed um, if, if, if you are bringing your hands to your face. Um, manage your hair. Hair is another thing that brings your hands up to your face uh, and also can interfere with uh, resident care and um, 
PPE. So disinfecting surfaces, the most recent um, published information is 24 hours on the porous materials and uh, up to 72 hours on um, non-porous. And, uh, you know, I, I've heard anecdotally longer times, but the messaging is disinfect the, your surfaces frequently um, and use uh, in your organization, use materials for, and disinfectants from the list N. Those are, uh, you know, um, good against the uh, coronavirus. So uh, be careful about making sure you clean before disinfecting and also observing dwell times. Um, that's one that people miss or forget about sometimes, uh, but trying to make sure the surface stays wet for the length of time needed. And then um, as uh, Dr. Woolsey mentioned also, the cleaning and disinfecting equipment or, or supplies shared by residents. Um, so uh, think this through, especially if they're isolation rooms um, that you, you're kind of doing a dirty to clean procedure when you're disinfecting something. Um, so make sure you have the right, you're putting things down on the right place and storing them or bagging them and it's clear whether something has been cleaned or, or disinfected yet or not. So just things to consider um, there. So these are the PPE recommendations uh, for different uh, resident situations in the COVID um, spectrum. So evaluating a resident suspected COVID-19 and a COVID-19 infected resident all have this PPE is the same, staff PPE is the same for all those situations of gloves, gown, eye protection, and face mask. Um, and then uh, a private room if possible, or a cohorting. Um, and then if the resident leaves their room, they are to wear a face mask. Face masks should preferentially be used for staff if there's shortage. So they can also use uh, other materials such as tissues or cloth materials to cover their nose and mouth. For testing with the nasal pharyngeal swab or nasal swabs, um, the definitely over time, there's it appears they're moving away from the, uh, the the negative pressure rooms. However, right now the CDC site still says that's preferred if available, but not required. And similarly, the N95 mask or respirator not required, uh, but if you can use it, that's preferred. Uh, and that is also definitely preferred for the aerosol generating procedures. Um, the aerosol generating procedures, we did find one reference that actually lists what those are. Uh, people tend to, <laughs> I see a lot of um, intubation, bronchoscopy, etc. cetera. Uh, so we did find one list. So you can reference that for your policies on when uh, to preferentially use an N95 mask, for example. So this is just some terminology. I won't read through it, but I did want to point out that uh, the crisis, contingency and crisis situations, or, or when you say we're in crisis, you are supposed to be meeting specific criteria. So I definitely would refer to uh, this website on the CDC site just to, so you know that you're meeting all those criteria. You know how much PPE you have, you know how fast you're going through it, you've communicated with your Department of Health. Uh, so, so look at that. Uh, and we're gonna be talking a lot about reuse and extended use. If you have a choice, it's preferred to do, do extended use. Um, and then uh, again, the aerosol generating procedures. And we do have a reference on that. So glove use, um, I did point out here how to remove gloves. Uh, and this is something to watch um, with, with your staff in general, make sure they're not just kind of peeling off their gloves, but are doing, ha doing it, you know, having a method that reduces contamination of their hands. So this is the dirty to dirty, clean to clean method. So you're, you're pulling up on your second glove with your first and turning it inside out. Uh, holding that in the first in the hand and then going underneath as a clean to clean. So your clean hand is actually going under that glove and turning it inside out on top of the first glove. Uh, so 
that's pretty much, there are a few variations on that, but that's pretty much the recommended way. So to, to watch people removing gloves is another, could be part of your hand hygiene program. Uh, you are able to, typically it's not recommended to sanitize gloves, but now you can sanitize uh, with an alcohol-based hand rub between procedures, but within a single resident encounter. So you still can't go room to room with the same gloves on, but you can sanitize the gloves within an encounter. Isolation gowns, uh, consider washable gowns. I know those are becoming very difficult to get, uh, and also that impacts your laundry uh, in a pretty big way. Um, extended use, uh, this, the recommendation for this is limited to um, a group of residents with the same condition and in the same location. So not recommended uh, to go room to room with the same gown, with people with different isolation um, you know, needs. Uh, that is the, the current um, recommendation. Uh, clustering tasks is a really good, good one to be looking at. I don't know how much work has been done with uh, by people on this, but just evaluating your workflow and making sure you're not going into rooms unnecessarily or, you know, that you're not doing a lot of moving in and out. Um, things like having someone in a hallway to help you with supplies as needed or having, uh, uh, you know, just distinct times you'll be trying to be in that room and even coordinating pharmacy and that sort of thing all together to uh, minimize uh, the amount of use of um, PPE. Another consideration is looking at your other policies for, for example, MDROs. Um, and then they did, the CDC did just put in a, uh, a section on reuse of cloth isolation gowns. And it is, um, really basically saying we don't know <laughs> much about how to reuse isolation gowns. Uh, they have really, they, they mention it, but they don't really have recommendations there. So uh, it, it kind of comes back to um, getting to the principles of what's clean and what's contaminated and doing the best you can to, uh, to you know, with the PPE you have. Uh, and, and that, the front and the the front outside and the sleeves of the isolation gown are um, what are considered contaminated, so you want to avoid touching those. Um, so eye protection, uh, again, you can, use, you can do extended use. You can leave it on for multiple residents uh, and not, as long as you don't touch it and you know, you can, you can just stay on your face. Reuse, you can remove and disinfect between uses. Um, typically, that's with a single user, but if disinfected, potentially, it could be multiple users. Um, uh, and then the thing you want to avoid is hanging eye protection or masks uh, around your neck. So uh, if you are going to disinfect, um, here's a, a protocol to do so. So you're going to have, your, if you're removing your PPE, you're going to remove your gloves that have been used already. Do hand hygiene, re-glove, disinfect the surface if needed, or if you know of a disinfected surface, you can use it. Remove the gloves, uh, the goggles or face shield, disinfect the inside and then the outside. So you're going from cleaner to less clean, and then uh, put wherever you're going to store that. But you have to think through like what surface you're going to put that on. So there are details in this, uh, and again, um, an extra time for hand hygiene maybe in the process of removing PPE that didn't exist before. For the non-N95 face masks, um, you can again use extended use for multiple residents. Uh, for reuse, you want to limit that to one healthcare worker as you've been breathing, one person has been breathing into that. Uh, you're going to store it folded and you want the contaminated, uh, the outside or the contaminated part of the mask inward. So what you're looking at right there is the out, the inside of the mask. Um, and then you want to keep it in a breathable bag. Uh, the, the rationale for that is that there's moisture in that mask after you've been breathing into it and you don't want to enclose it in like a plastic or a, a totally sealed container and, and put a name on that bag. 
so these are priorities for uh, face mask use. Um, and if there are absolutely no masks available, you, uh, use of a face shield with a cloth mask potentially under it. Um, there's some interesting research on engineering controls to reduce need for PPE, but I don't know, you know, how many of them are, you know, head of the bed airflow type systems. They may be in the future. I don't think a lot of people have that right now. And again, avoid hanging masks around your neck. N95 respirator. Um, these are, uh, you know, face mask respirators that, that require you to be fit tested. So you need a respiratory protection program. And you're going to need to do a seal check every time you put them on. Uh, and they can be um, used extensively. So patients, again, you avoid touching them while you're in a patient care area. Um, and, and you can also reuse them, and there's a, there are, uh, and actually reprocess, but for the reuse, um, you're just going to be removing it, and again, you're going to be removing it and needing to do hand hygiene before, you know, you're, you're done with your PPE, so, um, but, but this is a, a, this photo is an example, I, I did it at home, but it's, uh, it is what people are doing, uh, the bag should probably be slightly bigger, but the mask is actually hung on the handle of a paper bag and then you have your name on the outside alternatively you can put it in the bottom of the bag uh, with your name and then you can check how many times it's been used there's a limit to how many times you can reuse these masks sometimes they'll start to lose their seal or you're just going to get them kind of clogged up and five is one number i've heard but that's something you can kind of research for your uh, policy if you're reusing uh, the N95 respirators. Um, another thing about these is if you're putting it on for a, a second, third, or fourth time, you're when you're in that, you know, donning, you know, procedure, you've got to have your hands up to test your seal. So you need to be doing hand hygiene at times like that as well, which is a different than you normally would. This is the CDC removal. Many of you have probably seen this. This is just um, two ways you can remove PPE. And of course, it's all disposable here. And, you know, I understand people are moving to reusable and, um, and whatnot. But the, the basic principles are the same. You typically want to remove your gloves first because they are the most contaminated. Uh, in example two, there's a, a, a procedure where you remove the gloves and gown at the same time. Uh, this one is a good one to practice because it's um, it's not necessarily straightforward from the pictures, but uh, that's also an option. Um, and then the last thing you remove is your mask, which is below the cutoff here. But uh, and then the gown and, sh and uh, face shield, typically a gown second and face shield um, third. But uh, and hand hygiene uh, as needed, especially after removing gloves, but after any point in the, pro do in, in the doffing process, you can, you know, hand hygiene is a good idea. So this is just the basics on what's clean and what's contaminated after you've used PPE. So on your glove, it's pretty obvious, contaminated outside, clean inside. Uh, and so on, you can read, um, and I've probably mentioned all these, but keep these are what you want to keep in mind when you're looking at cleaning PPE where, where you didn't use to clean it or you're used to storing it when you <laughs> didn't use to store it. So when you're developing new policies, these are things to keep in mind and also how you're putting uh, PPE on and off. Tips. Uh, most of these are from the American Association of Family pra Practitioners. Uh, and this is um, things you can consider doing uh, to keep sort of work and home separate, which is not wear a uniform home or to work, but change at work and put your things in a disposable or washable bag. You want to do your laundry at the highest temperature you can and dry completely uh, and clean uniform or scrubs each shift. Um, considerations of staff challenges with laundering. If maybe people used to be used to a laundromat that they can no longer access, there can be difficulties with that now. Uh, disinfect cell phones regularly. So um, 
most disinfectants are acceptable, I think. I, I was just on the iPhone site and they said to use, I think they spe specified Lysol or Clorox wipes, but the, then another place says just spray with a disinfectant. So uh, clean that as much as possible. It might be a good time too to consider not using your phone at mealtimes, um, which is maybe a good idea anyway. Um, and then uh, this is soil laundry recommendations for COVID positive. So if somebody's in your home suspected or positive, uh, so you do want to take care while handling uh, their laundry. Um, no shaking as in the healthcare facilities, disinfect containers when you're done. And then just consider doing uh, your laundering your clothing more often than you might have before if you're like out in public even or obviously going to work. So. Uh, just a few um, tips there. So that brings us to today's guest. So I am really excited to introduce Kathy Owens. And uh, she is um, the Chief Clinical Officer at Avalon Healthcare Management. And she has graciously agreed to speak to us on her experience with developing competency, competency evaluations and training staff on reuse uh, of PPE. So extending those uh, re resources that are scarce now. So uh, first again, Kathy, I wanna thank you for speaking with us today about your experience. And do you wanna start by telling us about how you determined what changes you needed to make in PPE use with this COVID crisis? Yes, I'd be happy to. And thank you so much for this opportunity uh, today. We um, at Avalon Healthcare have been working very diligently with this process. And as I'm sure with all of you on the line, this has been a learning process. We started by asking, um, as soon as we realized that this was going to be uh, epidemic to pandemic, uh, we began having our central supply technicians begin to log the exact amount of PPE they have on a day-to-day -day basis. So we were cataloging that early on. That gave us a good sense of where we were with PPE and we could identify who was low and who wasn't. We're a, an organization with um, 45 properties and communities and so uh, we're sort of managing this at three different levels. And the most important level, of course, is at the facility level. So we started there. Then we decided uh, we needed to go into a true um, emergency response mode and began our incident command process. And we also improved our process for managing that PPE. And I'm, like I said, most of you on the call have probably already been through this process as well, but I really would encourage you to have a systematic process for, man for knowing what PPE you have on hand and, and knowing how to report that out, especially if, you've, if you're part of a group of facilities, it's a great way to determine um, how can you communicate what you have and what you need and when other people may have something they can deploy to you. Because we've been doing a lot of moving around within the organization which has been extremely helpful. But we learned that we needed to have a good accounting process. And then we, uh, with our incident command calls, we actually trend uh, more than just our PPE, but that's a big portion of what we do. We look at all of our COVID testing, who's been COVID tested, who's negative, if there's been a positive, we really haven't seen as many of those, thankfully. Um, but we trend that for both our residents and employees. We also trend the number of uh, individuals in a facility requiring isolation precautions. And we have created our own internal spreadsheet to be able to uh, estimate what our PPE needs will be based on who's in isolation. And that has been extremely helpful. Uh, our regional teams look at that. They have their incident command calls with the facilities daily. And then from an uh, organizational level, we also have our incident command meetings and review all of our PPE. So we're constantly looking at these numbers, looking to shift. And we have our procurement partners a part of this process. I mean, we are in lockstep with each other. And we identified early on that we were going to need to have contingency mode. Um, 
And uh, we continue, however, to do everything we can to source the availability of PPE. And um, one of the processes that we are encouraging our facilities to do is be able to, what I call demarcate, when you make that decision to go from, say, disposable gowns to cloth gowns, make a note of that, have an ad hoc copy process that reflects that you've reviewed your PPE, you've reviewed the needs of the facility, you've reviewed your supply chain, how that PPE is coming into your facility, and then make a statement in your copy minutes that you have very consciously moved to a contingency mode or a crisis mode to be able to provide PPE for your staff. I hope that makes sense. Does that answer your question, Martha? Yes, yes, thank you very much. So you, uh, you're you keeping an eye on everything all the time and I'm glad you brought up uh, the QAPI and uh, you know in incorporating this into that. Um, thank you very much, that was, that was great. Um, Jeff, could you uh, put up the competency? I can stop sharing. Uh, so we're just going to show an example of um, the competency that uh, Kathy's uh, organization put together. And Kathy, can you tell us what kind of training you're providing on your new PPE protocols? Uh, do you train the trainer or huddles, staff meetings? We use options, I guess I could say. Um, we've done a number of things, but a real core to what we do at Avalon, not just for infection prevention and control, but how we approach our um, education is um, this competency process. And so we have created competency checklists. And what we had to manage here, and I'm sure the rest of you have found the same thing, we've had competency checklists already in place for donning and doffing PPE. And that usually is the disposable gowns and disposable masks. Um, we haven't really, in most situations, required the use of goggles or eye shields or eyewear. So this has been a bit newer to our setting. So uh, we've had to actually update and create different competencies for different processes. For example, um, we had to create the competency check for donning the goggles or the face shield, and they're each a little different, right? So we had to uh, dem we had to be able to determine we wanted to create something that was flexible enough for the facility, depending on what they could get their hands on. Because I'm sure, just like the rest of you, we're even buying goggles from from Home Depot to be able to provide eyewear when it's indicated. Um, we uh, found as we've been getting into the reusable gowns, the, the cloth gowns, that we had created a competency that you could tie uh, the cloth gowns. And that's what most of us are used to in, in a number of our settings um, and even in educational settings. Uh, but what we ended up getting sourced from our big supplier were gowns that didn't, re there, I call them wraparound gowns, that didn't require ties. So we then had to create a, oh no, hello? We can hear you. We can yeah. hear you, Kathy. Okay. We can still okay, hear. Okay, so my screen changed and it looked like it was, it was um, changing here, sorry. Um, so we, um, we had to, uh, we had to create a competencies that are for, we have right routine competencies, then we have the competencies for reusable gowns that are tied in the back, and then we have a competency for um, the wraparound or the, the cloth gown. And I think I sent all of those samples over so that you can share with the audience that they can use. And so I'll put, that's a primary focus for us. And we do really focus on the importance of, of the um, return demonstration. So with competency checklists, it's so critical that we just don't check off, that people know what to do, that we watch what they have to do, and that everyone demonstrates they're able to do it. Because this process is very, it's, it's in a very critical process, and it, it's very easy to touch the contaminated portion of the PPE. And it takes um, people staying really focused in the moment on when they put on and take off their PPE so that they don't contaminate clean surfaces or their clean hands, et cetera. 
So we, that's a big focus for us. In some of our facilities, we've, um, had, where we've suggested this and we'll be probably putting a little more meat behind this, but we were asking that uh, you identify a, an infection champion, a PPE champion who sort of is a spotter and that and watches what the um, what the uh, individuals are doing um, as they do their return demonstrations, but also out on the floor. How are they doing with their hand hygiene? Uh, how are they doing with uh, donning and doffing the PPE? And we've even suggested that these spotters or these champions wear something that really makes them stand out. One of our facilities is in a bright yellow vest with um, uh, infection control queen on <laughs> the way to do that. So it's, it's really very, um, you can make this fun. It doesn't have to be harsh and people don't have to be scared. This is something we really want people to feel, get to second nature with. And so really observing, giving each other very powerful feedback, um, very, um, uh, I think someone was saying compassionate feedback um, so that because this is scary for everyone and and people want to do it right I I have to say I am so excited to see how everyone is responding I'm so sad that we are in this situation with this pandemic but I am incredibly um, I'm incredibly um, impressed with how well everyone is doing with mobilizing and it's bringing our teams together we want each other we want us to help each other do this right because it's in the best interest of our team members as well as our residents so this is a this is a very action oriented and you can make it a lot of fun in uh, some facilities we're actually having ppe don and doff stations as people are entering the facility so that um especially where we may have a high number of, of an outbreak going on if it, Often these are turning out to not be COVID situations, but it's that time of year where we're still seeing human metanumavirus and influenza A, and so we have a number of things going on. So we um, we have adopted reuse and extended wear in a number of our facilities, and um, and so we're we're doing different different approaches. The other thing I want to just shout out for our, our veterans home in Payson, Utah. That team has just been so much fun to work with. They've actually created a, a wonderful video and demonstrates. And so now we're using a video with the type of PPE that we're actually, um, that we're actually being sourced. And, um, and this was a wraparound PPE. And so it's been uh, very helpful to have that video available for our teams and it's received a lot of, of good reviews. Great, thank you. Um, one last question is, how, have you had to make adjustments to your processes and how do you communicate uh, out? You know, you're obviously over a large organization. What is your communication like and it, it, all the change, how is that received by your staff? That's a great question and, um, and it's had me nervous, I'll be honest, because it's um, our days, right? Every day are so busy and uh, what is uh, consistency is a, a hallmark of good practice. And so uh, what we did from the outset, we recognized very early on, this was gonna be a changing climate and that there were a lot of unknowns about coronavirus. We still don't completely understand the behavior of this virus. And so we are, uh, as we learn more, we're able to adapt, um, which is, is good. So we, right from the outset, acknowledged that there were going to be changes and that we would communicate those changes. Um, we, we created a progressive management tool because we, sort, we had visualized uh, four like, phases of this process. And we've been able to use that, that progressive management tool to, to help um, our leaders and our facilities figure out what do we do now with activities? What do we do now with dining processes. And then as the overarching guidance has changed, we've updated that tool as well. So we, uh, that has been, a, I think, a good way to help our facilities navigate where they fall on the spectrum. And most of our facilities now are, well, uh, most of them are level threes. That's where you actually have it in the community uh, at large, where the facility is, um, is situated. 
and level four is where you have a positive case. So, um, <coughs> excuse me, so that's been very helpful to be able to communicate. But I think the most important thing is, is communicating frequently. Uh, we're having our company calls twice a week. And I know I've seen some names pop up as you logged on and so, several of our Avalon facilities are online and could attest to this where, and, and what's been fun about those calls is uh, we schedule those for an hour and frequently the question, we'll stay on for questions and go an additional half hour. And time is at a minimum these days, but people are, um, people are really engaged in, in this process and asking a lot of great questions. Uh, we're also posting frequently asked questions um, that is helpful. And we've identified uh, and from our intranet a location for people to go for resources and we alert them when we updated those resources. So that's from an overarching organizational component. Uh, we also have, um, our facilities have got wonderful leaders and they are also communicating frequently with their teams when there are changes. And I've been so impressed and I just really wanna give a shout out to our teams. I know in Avalon and I'm, I'm guessing this is the same everywhere, is people are really embracing these changes. I've never seen changes be adopted so quickly in facilities. So for example, when we ad adapted some of our screening tools so that we could be right on target with what CDC and CMS were requiring, um, I never heard a peep. I, people just took it and did it and embraced it fully and it's just been phenomenal on how they've applied the screening guidance, for example, and also our resident, daily resident monitoring processes. Uh, we've had to tweak that process and, and people are just taking it and doing it. And it's, I think when, um, when we frame this as we're in this together, we're all a team. We're also extremely open to feedback and we, this is a learning process. We learn so much from everyone and we are, every suggestion we consider and think about how should, is, should we and how can we integrate that into what we're doing. Um, and then we, we try to time the changes so that they're not every day. Uh, for example, trying to do changes like once a week if we can. Um, we've also um, learned a lot because we do have facilities in the um, uh, hot zone of uh, Seattle and our chief medical officer practices uh, geriatrics and is affiliated with University of Washington School of Medicine. Uh, so we have had the, the advantage of learning from that and have been able to adapt practices uh, even sooner than they came out from CMS or uh, from CDC based on what uh, they're learning at ground zero every day with this virus. So that's, that's been helpful for us. I think just like you did, Martha, and Dr. Woolsey did, really um, trying to show that there's evidence based by the steps that we're taking and that we are doing our best to stay, um, to stay as current as possible and I think that uh, for me, it's reassuring and I wanna make sure our staff and our residents are all safe. So being able to demonstrate that evidence base behind the decisions that are being made has been very helpful. I hope that answered your question. Yes, that, that was so fabulous. And we so appreciate your coming on and talking to us about your experience. We've had a lot of requests for your competency and I believe you did say that you are willing to share those? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so we can find a way to get those out to participants. And um, I think now we can open up for uh, questions from chat. Shannon, did you? Sorry, um, yes. oh. oh, it's oh. Shannon. Good, I could jump in, but yeah. My apologies, sorry, my mute button was not being friendly. Um, okay, so I wanted to comment, there were a couple questions that were asked and answered in chat, but I did um, want to first comment for those of you asking for slides, we did send them out in advance and we'll follow up after the session with the recorded presentation. I believe we could probably include the slides again and resource links as well as the competencies. So you'll get everything that we have here um, that we provided to you today. Um, real quickly, Dr. Woolsey, you did answer a couple of questions, but there was one I just hoped you might elaborate. We had a question about um, for reusable PPE, whether plastic or paper, 
was better. And then also um, whether staff should wear masks while working to protect residents. So could you elaborate on your responses in chat? Yeah, yes. So the question about kind of reuse, extended use, if you're reusing something that is is um, cleaned, you'll want to clean it and store it as it's to be cleaned. So I think that the answer really relates to the item. So if you're able to clean something and reuse it, then you'll want to store it as it's to be stored. If you're doing the, the reuse, like the mask picture that Martha showed really well with the, the paper sack, the idea is to get that, that moisture out of that because COVID likes moisture. And so having it in a breathable paper sack for your N95s or masks. And then most people are also just you know open air storage of, of uh, goggles as well. So it depends on the item. If you're doing it like with a respirator, just use the recommendations. If they recommend sanitization of the respirator and then bagging it, do that as per the um, instructions. And then what was the second one I already forgot, Shannon? Oh, masks and facilities. So um, masks. Um, so I would just say that a number of locations, and I, you know, welcome Kathy's input here. Um, if you have surgical face masks available for your staff to wear universally, be, if you're in a community where there is community spread, um, probably best practice to to have folks wear that mask in case in case of a cough um, or a sneeze that occurs. Um, it's best practice, but we're aware that many facilities do not have enough. Um, and so we just want to mention that, you know, that that's, that's the reality there. But many folks are choosing to have their staff wear masks um, all the time. Any comment from you on that one, um, Kathy, the practicality there? Um, that's, it's a great question. And we as an organization are looking at this carefully again right now. Um, the biggest challenge has been availability availability of the PPE. And so how we're approaching it is obviously we prioritize the resident needs. Mm -hmm. um, then from there, we determine what are our next best steps. We are allowing staff to wear masks if they want to wear masks. And we are, right as we speak, looking at some additional options. It is, it's a conundrum a bit, isn't it? Because uh, the availability of PPE. So it's it's constantly looking and thinking about what is our what's our rank order for PPE, um, how are we um, what's our priority of need, and then we try to meld that. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, just staying on the mask um, question for a moment. Again, if there are no positive cases of residents within the center, can you speak to some recommendations? You want to take that one, Martha? Do you want me to? I would actually, I think I need to review that again, but I think that um, if there are no, if there, yeah, if there are no positives, I don't think it's a, like a requirement. However, uh, again, speaking back to Kathy's uh, comments on, do you have enough to do it? And, um, you know, are you, you know, yeah, it's not a requirement. Yeah, and, and again, I want to sort of the, the principle, and I don't think the CDC has made it requirement, absolutely not. Um, but the principle, I think, is that healthcare workers are a risk factor. And so if we are covering our, um, our secretions, that's probably best practice. I know our, our university hospital in, in Utah has started to do that, but they have supply. And I feel like we really need to, to be cautious and careful and, like Kathy said, really have people feel safe and, and do the things that are best for them. I know um, some practices, outpatient practices will, for example, issue one mask, and then it's the job of the person to, to care for that as best that they can. Obviously, if it's damaged, if it's soiled, it's not appropriate to use anymore. Um, so there's some rationing practices that occur. Um, so in the, in the ideal world, yes, we'd have them. Um, I think it's a, it's a good practice, and I think you have to watch your burn rate and availability. So along, again, a PPE question along those lines. Um, can one of you elaborate a bit more on CDC guidelines on how to safely reuse and remove PPE due to shortages when you do have somebody who has tested positive or presumptive positive? And can you perhaps expand into a discussion of gowns? Well, I, uh, the gown question, uh, it, it, they, they have 
basically they don't don't really have recommendations on gowns out there. In fact, as of this morning when I looked, um, that was the first time I'd seen any mention of reusing gowns at all on the CDC site. So uh, I would say that, uh, and I know Kathy has, you know, we've been hearing about it. People are needing to to act on it because we don't have enough, you know, pr product out there. But uh, there have been um, I've seen discussion. Uh, Jeff probably, but Wes probably has more information or Kathy on this, um, on double gowning, you know, putting on a, a layer over a layer uh, with the second layer being less, covering less, but that being a reusable and leaving another gown on under it. Um, and then Kathy, of course, has the policy in place. Uh, well, maybe, maybe people don't know that, but one of her competencies is on removing gowns, uh, cloth mm -hmm. gowns and reusing them and so depending on the type of gown she has two different competencies so it is not really a cdc driven uh thing at this point um and all you know i was just looking i i, I uh no i don't think there are any videos on gown removal and reuse but there, you know i was even searching for videos uh, to give give people an idea of ways you could do things, um, but it's there's nothing uh, out there formal that's 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 blessed, shall we say? So Martha, it's, um, yeah, go ahead, Kathy. Martha, I was wondering if um, that you're uh, in acknowledging all that you've said. Um, when you also when you go to the CDC website, they just like Martha, you had had shared. You have your routine mode, then your contingency, then your crisis mode, and in those designations they do uh, reference the reuse and extended wear. And so um, we're, the way that we're prioritizing, of course, if we've got disposable gowns available, we'll use those first. They don't last, they, they don't lend themselves well to reusability because they tear so easily. Um, but what we are doing and what they're doing up in the Seattle area, from what I understand, um, is we are still doing the extended wear gowns, the cloth gowns, and then we do the um, uh, patient gowns on top as our second gown. And that's how we're instructing. We only have one situation where we are needing to do this, but it's, um, it's been reassuring to think through that. And it's for those of you who are planning ahead and as part of our pandemic plan, planning ahead for that dedicated COVID unit, that uh, we've all been asked to at least plan for, even if we may not admit to it. You want to look at that because um, your the use the availability of PPE is everything, and that extra gown to go on top of the reusable gown is really critical. What we're asking is that that gets washed after use. Um, you but you can take it. You can doff it and still hang it. But I I I'm preferring that we just take that gown and toss it in a um, laundry receptacle for a wa wash and that that second gown doesn't necessarily get reused. Um, so it's, a, and it's another way to think about it. You can also, um, I mean, where it, it just feels, it does feel a little, um, you know, we were all taught very strict and we should be practicing very strict infection prevention and control. So it's a new day, isn't it, for us that we're, thinking about this and talking through this, but we're also looking at how do we extend the sleeves on a patient gown? Uh, is there some kind of, um, we were getting a lot of offers from our communities, as I'm sure you are, can we make cloth masks for you? Can we make gowns for you? And um, so, you know, in engaging folks and getting a complement of patient gowns that you've got some extended sleeves on that would provide you that extra coverage if you would need it. Hopefully, as we've been, um, we've been hearing there may be more supplies in route, and we're really excited to hear what that's going to look like. Uh, we're hoping, too, that if you are in a situation where you've got a positive COVID case in a facility, that that would prioritize you to get that upper tier of PPE. Um, so I just, um, those are just some thoughts to be thinking about. But that's, um, that's the suggestion that we've received that is also in use up in Seattle, King County. So 
Thank you, Kathy, Martha, for all the questions that are coming in. I want to recognize we're just about a minute to the end. There's a couple questions we haven't answered and a resource um, request around uh, people with dementia and uh, doing respiratory programs. And Leah uh, Brandis, one of our uh, state leads in Oregon, will send that resource. We'll attach that to the items. We'll make sure we answer the last few questions that haven't been done. Um, we do have a survey. We'd like to hear your feedback on the session today. If you could take a minute to um, fill, fill that out for us and please send other questions, um, requests for support. I know I had mentioned, um, you know, virtual care may be an area that, that our community would be interested in. in. If you are, please let us know. And um, just want to thank everybody who uh, got this organized and had this happen. Martha, thank you for your presentation and uh, Kathy for your really wise, wise information and for sharing so many tools. Um, and again, for everybody who've, at, who've attended today, thank you for your time. It's valuable and um, please let us know how we can support you. Um, anything else we need to say, Martha? Um, I don't think so, but just want to thank everyone again, uh, especially um, Kathy for coming on and everyone for taking the time to, to join us today. All right. Appreciate it, everybody.